The Bible reading today is from Romans 8, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Nicolee. Good morning, everyone. The Lord be with you. Maybe share a shalom to each other before we start. Shalom, shalom, shalom. (laughs) Shalom, shalom. Right. So, um... We've been reflecting on the theme of the living under the grace of God following the Romans reading, the lectionary, over the past two Sundays. I wonder if you have a chance to reflect that again on what we have learned from the messages or the life of the Apostle Paul. Last week, we briefly talked about one of the biggest challenges that Paul had to face in his journey as an as an apostle it was about the big gap between what's in his brain on top here and what is actually going on in his heart and between what he thought he believed and what he was experiencing in his life and namely between the Christian theory and practice I believe we were somehow able to identify the Apostle Paul's struggle with our own challenges in our lives. The key verses last week were Romans chapter 7, 24, 25. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I'd like to invite us to spend a little bit of time to reflect on this particular passage today, then move on to today's reading, Romans chapter 8. I challenged you last week to think of the time when you brought a similar prayer like this to the Lord in your journey of faith. If you have experience like that, I believe it must have been a really challenging moment in your life. Because in a sense, it may have caused you to question yourself or even doubt on God's faithfulness, his love and mercy and care for you, as well as your relationship with the Lord to its core. For those who have experienced this big faith challenge, would be able to understand 
how real Paul's desperate internal cry for help is in anyone's faith journey. But at the same time, how much rewarding and special it can be with regards to getting deeper into the living grace of God as well as intimate relationship with the Lord. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will rescue me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Paul was an apostle. As we all know, apostles are those who had the first-hand experiences of Jesus. They are the eyewitnesses of what our Lord did while he was on earth. His life, his death, his resurrection, and all the miracles and teachings he gave to his followers. And they were the first group of people who laid foundation of what we now believe the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, Evangelion. So in a sense, they are the pillars of the church, the believer's community, since its beginning. What they shared with the people of their time became the gospel message, which the church has treasured and preserved until the present day. In other words, their eyewitness accounts, as well as what they wrote about the profound transformation that occurred in their own lives, became the cornerstone upon which we, as well as countless Christian believers worldwide, place our trust. Their testimonies serve as a foundation of our faith. Because of the joy of salvation they found in the risen Lord Jesus, just like the Samaritan woman at the well who ran back to the village people to introduce Jesus to them, they could not keep it to themselves. So Paul and other, other apostles went out and boldly proclaimed and shared what they had experienced in Christ Jesus, which we now call the gospel, wherever they went and whenever they had opportunities to share. So Paul, after the encounter with the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, when he was in his 20s, until he was martyred under the Roman Emperor Nero in his 60s, for about 30 or 40 years, Paul shared his faith in the Lord with the people in Asia Minor and taught them about the Son of the Living God and built churches. So, as you see, his mission journeys are just amazing. The distance he traveled to reach out to people of the time is unbelievably long. And it would have been really, really tough. No motorways, no planes, no cars. I wonder how one man could travel that long distance and spent that long years by himself just to share the gospel. He recalled some of the challenges that he endured during those 30 or 40 years journey, mission journeys as an apostle. To 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, I've, I've been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again, Five different times, the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times, I was beaten with rods. Once, I was stoned. Three times, I was shipwrecked. Once, I spent the whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews as well as from the Gentiles. 
I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Hmm. What do you think? Paul's journey. This amazing man of faith, almost at the end of his journey, after enduring those tough moments, is confessing his struggle to the believers in Rome. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Oh, what a miserable person I am. How can we understand this? For an apostle, not just a church goer, what does this mean? What does this dilemma mean to him? Let's listen to some of the different contemporary versions of this cry for help. David Guzik said, anyone who has tried to do good is aware of this struggle. We never know how hard it is to stop sinning until we try. And C.S. Lewis said, no man knows how bad he is until he has tried to be good. What do you think? Paul, as an apostle, must have tried his best to be good, to be righteous, to be thankful, faithful, loving, kind, forgiving, generous. All the great gifts that he believed had received from the Lord. But he seems to have reached the point of his limit, threshold, where he constantly faced his sinful desires. The tendency in relying on himself and what belongs to him, not on what belongs to the Lord. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. I hate the desires to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. So Romans chapter 7, 24 again. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? I wonder, what made Paul question his identity, his confidence in his faith, and his relationship with the Lord? And when did this struggle began in his faith journey? Chapter, 24, chapter 7, verse 25. He said, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And I also wonder, how long, how long it took for Paul to find the answer in Jesus Christ in verse 25. I wonder how many days, weeks, a month, or years that he had to spend in between the time of the verse 24 and the verse 25. And what kind of emotional, spiritual, and relational challenges were involved in that period, whatever long it might be. One important thing we can find from this particular passage is that Paul says, who will deliver me? Who will set me free or who will rescue me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? The answer to Paul's dilemma was a who, not how. It was a person who would deliver him from the condition of defeat. And Paul could not do this by himself. He knew that he needed outside help to deal with 
the overpowering influence of this sin capacity. However, in a sense, it is comforting to know that even the great Apostle Paul faced challenges that may, many would not expect to happen to him. Let me share with you the moment of my own struggle when I was in my 20s, which I can easily identify myself with Paul and his own face challenge. I think I've shared with you a couple of times of my experience, but I believe it is relevant to today's topic. So please allow me to share it again. I was serving a small Korean church soon after I came to Australia 25 years ago. So compared to my home church in Korea, that particular church from my perspective didn't seem to have good leadership structure or vibrant ministry. So I thought I might be able to share my skills and talents that I believed I had to help the church to be better. So I did a lot. And one day I went to the minister and said, Minister, I think um, our church needs to have a prayer meeting. If you wouldn't mind, I want to I wanna run a Friday evening prayer gathering at church so that people can come and pray together for our church and our church families. So the minister said yes. So I spent lots of time and energy in preparation for the prayer, prayer meeting. I went to the church usually two hours before the meeting to choose songs and to sing and practice and to pray for the prayer gathering every Friday. It started well, 20 or 30 people every Friday night for a couple of months. But the numbers went down gradually. So on that particular Friday evening, there was only a couple of people came. Standing on the stage, leading music and prayers on my own, I felt no one seems to be interested in prayer, even the minister. I spent two hours, sometimes more than that, giving up my precious time on Friday. But compared to my effort, I thought the congregation didn't seem to respond well to the leading of the Spirit. Mixed feelings, of course. Most of them were discouraging and negative. Disappointments, regrets, frustration, bitterness and anger against the church and the people. Lord, I spend this much time and energy every Friday evening, let alone many other things that I do for the, for the people and the church. But what is this? What is this that I have to deal with? I don't know what to do. Is this what you want me to do? I cannot work with or for these people. They don't seem to have faith at all. I have no energy left. Have I done anything wrong? What is this all negative feelings going on in my mind? It doesn't seem right to me. Where is your grace and where is your love? Burnt out completely. Completely. The God that Paul Speed, Steve believed in back then was a God who was not faithful enough and not steadfast enough in his care and mercy for him. Steve was trying to hold his God, whomever that might be, within his limited biblical and theological boundaries. 
So whenever he encountered life challenges, even minor and seemingly insignificant matters that were unworthy to consideration, sometimes became significant burdens or challenges for him. Even when he was carrying out the ministry in the name of the Lord and for his glory and honor, everything had to fit within his limited understanding and perspective. In other words, he was trying to keep the immeasurable grace of God in his little bowl of intellectual capacity. So whenever he faced challenges that tested the depth of his understanding, he felt compelled to construct a protective wall of protection, perfection around himself to safeguard his vulnerable and fragile soul. So within those walls, he was constantly criticizing and condemning himself for not being good, for not being mature, for not being kind, loving, forgiving, caring, wise, friendly, generous, and not being faithful enough, and not being Christian enough. In other words, not being perfect. It was a tormenting experience for him. Like being trapped in a pitch dark, seemingly inescapable, hellish dilemma. So he felt a deep internal struggle with the cries of anguish within himself. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I do not do the good what I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Who will rescue me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? It was Steve's cry for help back then. Then this verse came to him as a bright light in the completely dark tunnel. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, which we do this, read this every month. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Let me read it again. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So Steve was sitting on a bench at Asheville Park. The Holy Spirit reminded him of this passage. The bright light this living word of God came to him. Steve back then didn't really know what standing before the Lord really meant to him until then. When he was struggling with his own criticism and condemnation, Christ has already declared there is no condemnation for him. He knew about it and he even thought about it. But he didn't really believe it. No condemnation, no judgment, no criticism. Is it true? Is it real?
Now let's listen again to what Paul has discovered, the renewed joy that he has found. Thank God. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God the answer is not in me. Thank God the answer is not in my deeds. Thank God the answer is not my ability. Thank God the answer is not in my perfection. But in Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 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 (laughs) Amen. This is an ongoing journey for all of us. But the path is not unknown. Because our Lord Jesus has already walked before us. Because he is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. So tomorrow, tomorrow is my birthday, 17th of July. It happened 1998, 17th of July. I am 25 years old, (laughs) 25 years old, spiritually, spiritually. So I'm planning to go to Asheville tomorrow. I have a time to wander around the streets that I walked while this thing was going on in my life. I'll probably go to uh, the church there and the park again to remember those moments when the change took place and probably give thanks to God and worship Him in whatever way I can. So what can I say? What can I say? I really give thanks to God for you. That you have been walking with the Lord. And Jesus Christ has always walked before you, beside you. And the journey ahead of us is very clear because he has opened the way for us in his grace and love. I'd like to just want to share a piece with you before we sing the two songs. So whatever you want to share with your brothers and sisters here today, so let's share that grace and peace with each other. So would you please stand? And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Okay, let's share the peace.